we performed our study among rheumatoid arthritis patients, all of whom had COVID-19, and all of which were being treated with either biologic or targeted synthetic DMARDs. So the real take home is that the medications patients are on at baseline, if they do develop COVID-19, this seems to affect their disease course. Some of these medications could put patients at increased risk of poor outcomes, in particular rituximab, um, and also JAK inhibitors, which is a novel finding in the study, might put patients at risk for poor outcomes. Conversely, some of these medications might actually confer uh, protective effects for bad outcomes, in particular things like TNF inhibitors and interleukin-6 inhibitors. I think there were a few reasons why we decided to approach this study designed for the did. One is that the, you know, we all know that there's been a lot of data put out there since COVID was first recognized a year ago, and um, just an, a, an incredible amount, which has been uh, really unbelievable, but it, it still has left a lot of uncertainty, especially in our space, um, with how patients with rheumatic diseases do when they have COVID-19. And so we were in a unique position because of our work with the Global Rheumatology Alliance that we had the ability to use a very large registry um, with a very large cohort to kind of ask questions that couldn't necessarily be easily answered using other data sources. Um, so one point was we wanted to address some of the ongoing uncertainty, especially with regard to the medications that Dr. Sparks mentioned, um, which hadn't necessarily been well evaluated in other studies. The second is we wanted to expand on some of the prior observations that have been made, primarily by focusing on patients with rheumatoid arthritis, because a lot of the previous work had been done in more heterogeneous populations, patients with a variety of systemic rheumatic diseases. And so we thought that uh, because we had a larger sample size, we'd be able to really hone in on patients with rheumatoid arthritis um, who had similar indications for treatment, and that would uh, make some of our analyses a bit more robust. And then I think the third was we really wanted to just generate robust data that could really help inform management guidelines moving forward um, and strategies for mitigating risks in these patients who, who might be at higher risk for worse outcomes and are, are clearly concerned about that risk. So in this study, we used the COVID-19 Global Rheumatology Alliance, which I'm sure most people are familiar with. It's a, a voluntary physician registry that really started at the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, and for this study, we used all the data up until mid-April of 2021. So it's a pretty uh, contemporary data set. And as Dr. Wallace pointed out, a lot of the previous studies were performed among basically all rheumatic diseases. And this one, we wanted to really hone in on just rheumatoid arthritis to try to make sure that, um, that some of the findings that we found were related to the drug and not related to the indication. So um, for that reason, we really restricted the, the patient sample to rheumatoid arthritis and to patients who were on biologic and targeted or tar targeted synthetic DMARDs at baseline at the moment they were uh, infected with COVID-19. So I think just the, the study sample um, and obviously the large nature of it was uh, a real novelty. The second thing we looked at were the outcomes. And unlike previous studies, we really looked at the entire breadth of outcomes related to COVID-19. A lot of previous studies had only looked at a, a particular single outcome. So we looked at uh, whether patients were hospitalized, whether they received oxygen or were ventilated in the, in the hospital, and also whether they died and, and really came up with this COVID-19 ordinal skill that was modeled after clinical trials skills that we're doing similarly. So this way we got to really look at all the granularity of the data and also look at each of these outcomes uh, separately. Um, so in this, in this way, we were able to really hone in on whether the drugs might alter the course of COVID-19. I think we, have, um, we had two main findings, and that was that patients um, who received rituximab especially uh, have worse outcomes overall. And when I say worse outcomes, as Dr. Sparks mentioned, we used this ordinal scale. So it's to say that, you know, compared to someone who isn't on rituximab, who's on one of these other biologics or or targeted synthetic DMARDs that we study, patients on rituximab would be kind of like one level higher or one degree worse than, the, than their comparator patients. Um, and so, so that was one observation. And the other that was, that was particularly novel was that we observed that patients who used JAK inhibitors at baseline um, also did worse. 
Uh, this is you know, perhaps a little surprising because there's also been trials showing that patients who use who received baricitinib to, to treat COVID um, did better in some way. And so it's, it's a little counterintuitive, but, you know, it may be that being on these medications prior to or at the time of infection is different than using this medication like baricitinib once you are sick and you have this sort of hyperinflammatory response that's characteristic of severe COVID-19. And so I think that there are some there's some areas there and it needs to be that deserve further study and clarification. Um, but those are our two I think main take home take home findings. We certainly wonder about how this uh, finding with rituximab extends to other CD20 inhibitors and other indications. So. Um, I would suspect that this would probably affect other patients, and obviously rituximab is used for many other indications, and there's other CD20 inhibitors. Um, so I think that would be a, a logical next step, and, and really how to mitigate the risk. Now that we know it's there, what can we do? Um, and the obvious thing is vaccination, and certainly we encourage that, but unfortunately with rituximab, uh, it does seem that the vaccine is much less likely to work successfully. Um, so. There's a lot of concern, obviously, on patients' part about the behaviors and when they can um, come out of this pandemic without the shielding behaviors and whether there's other strategies such as monoclonal antibodies that should be employed. So I think there's really a lot of very important and urgent uh, findings that should stem from this research. I would just add, I think, with regard to our observations regarding JAK inhibitor as a class, um, I think we are interested in exploring further whether there are differences um, with specific JAK inhibitors, because it may not be a, um, an effect associated with all JAK inhibitors, since we know there are some differences between specifically which JAKs um, these drugs interfere with. And so I think that's another area that needs to be kind of further explored to confirm our findings and expand upon them. Yeah, and similar to glucocorticoids, where it seems that baseline use uh, is associated with poor outcomes, and yet dexamethasone is one of the backbone therapies for patients with COVID, it seems that maybe JAK inhibitors, it could be an issue of timing, that uh, perhaps being on JAK inhibitors at the moment you're infected is perhaps not good, but uh, there might be a window of opportunity where JAK inhibitors, particularly baricitina, which has trial data, could, could actually be a therapeutic. So I think that's an interesting uh, new paradigm to discover as far as when to, when to treat, not just whether to treat.